Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, college football fans across the nation and around the world. This is Tim May with the Tim May Podcast. And man, I had to get this co-pilot back on with me this week. Uh, uh, the, I don't know if those were rocky, rocky skies we flew through the other day, uh, Bill Bender, uh, on Saturday of this past week, or whether it was created some smooth sailing for some folks. But uh, once again, college football did not disappoint with some wild, wild, uh, pardon the expression, uh, stem winders. Well, it was a lot of fun. I mean, it, you know, I think the big game that everybody thought was going to be a lot of fun with uh, Georgia and Tennessee, I wouldn't say a letdown, just a reminder that Georgia's pretty good on both sides and they they proved that they're the beast in the SEC East. And the evening it was where the surprises came in, you know, Clemson getting throttled at Notre Dame um, and then Alabama and LSU, of course. And I always say, you know, when Alabama gets that second loss, um, it's almost like the entire college. I was at a lacrosse tournament with a bunch of dads and we were sitting around playing cards and those kind of things that you do. Yeah. And uh, we, uh, there was like a full fledged celebration when Alabama lost. Um, it, it's because it creates opportunity for the rest of the college football world when that happens. Well, my, my, uh, my younger brother, uh, I used to have three brothers. Now I've got one, but my, my youngest brother, I call him my baby brother. He's going to be 65 this year, but, uh, Huge Alabama fan. I know he went to the bathroom probably 18 times in the last 20 minutes of that game and uh, probably never sat down. And he may have not sat down yet. I better check on him, right? But the bottom line is it does it does give hope and joy to a lot of other people when Alabama bites the dust uh, sooner rather than later. And that's what I want you as my co-pilot this week. I wanted you to first uh, uh, address the passengers who are on – the plane right now are looking to jump on a plane. Who are the planes the passengers should be jumping on right now? Well, I, I mean, TCU, obviously. I mean, they, they've got a big game this week against Texas. I think they are uh, control their own destiny in the Big 12. Not a lot of meat on the schedule. Everybody else has three losses. Um, you know, outside of that, I, I guess USC or Oregon, you know, they're, they're, they still have hope, although the Pac-12 – may have trouble getting into the playoff. And um, you know, I, I hate to say it on this one, but I mean, there there's at least a debate now with Michigan and Ohio State. I, I didn't, I saw, I believe in the AP, Ohio State still two, right? Yes. But I don't know if the gap got closed a little bit. I yeah, mean, Michigan now, three, yeah. Yeah, you've been down this road before. The anticipation for that game over the next three weeks is only going to build if those two take care of business because – I think at least in some voters' minds, there there's at least a chance that Michigan can go into Columbus and win that game. Oh yeah. There's there there there's a chance, that's for sure. Uh, you know, well, I'm looking at it right now if they can run the both of them have a little bit of a have a little bit of a road to take, though. I mean, with Michigan a couple of weeks uh, hosting Illinois and Ohio State having to play in Maryland, obviously Ohio State uh hosts uh Indiana this week and it got trounced by Penn State over the weekend. But uh what I want to get back to though with you and handing you the microphone for the announcements to the passengers. Who's, who's playing or people jumping off of big time right now, do you think? Well, well obviously Alabama, but uh, well, Clemson, other than Alabama, ACC. Right? Yeah, the ACC. Right. The ACC is in a little trouble because Clemson getting beat like that is so eye-opening. They don't have a ton left on their schedule that, that they can really impress with. I think um, the ACC as a whole – I do like North Carolina. I, I like I actually like North Carolina's playoff case a little better than Clemson's right now because they also played Notre Dame. They had that loss, but what they have going for them is a quarterback in Drake May that has numbers that are comparable to CJ Stroud and Hendon Hooker. They have Mac Brown, who everybody, if you've been around Mac Brown, it's he's impossible not to like. And sure. then um they'll have an ACC championship chance against Clemson. So if I, I guess my question is if TCU played North Carolina, that line's probably going to be pretty small, and they're both going to score a ton of points. So I still think their playoff hopes are very much alive, even if the ACC as a whole in a little bit of trouble. Wow, that's interesting. Never thought about that uh, about uh, North Carolina coming coming uh, coming on strong from on the back stretch or in the front stretch, um, whatever stretch it is. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, down the stretch, uh, Drake May. By the way, no relation. He has an E on the end of his name. It's like Lee May and Lee May back in the good old days of baseball. Uh, but, uh, boy, that guy is phenomenal. 
I mean, lo I love watching him play Drake May. Also, a lot like watching as uh, Marlon Kerner, my, my middle guest this week. I mean, uh, he and I chop up the Ohio State football team at the moment coming off that game at Northwestern over the weekend that left a lot of people disappointed, even though for the 70th time, Ohio State scored 20 or more points in a game, uh, an FBS record. Uh, 21 to 7 was not what most people were counting on, but of course, most people weren't counting on there being almost gale force wind over there the entire game. So uh, I think Ohio State escaped with that. You and I'll come back and we'll talk a little bit about that after my conversation with Marlon. But I want to ask you this before uh, I move to that conversation with Marlon. Uh, is Notre Dame, is that is that as remarkable? I mean, obviously, LSU had a shot against Alabama. I think most people thought that, thought that. But Notre Dame, wow. Well, a lot of people were – there were even murmurs up there. Did Notre Dame make a big mistake with Marcus Freeman after the first seven, uh, six, seven weeks of this season, especially after that lost, uh, what, to Stanford? Uh, you know, obviously Ohio State and Marshall, but uh, the loss to Stanford made people really scratch their head. But, wow, I, I think that's almost uh, for the middle of the season. That's almost coach of the year for the middle of the season. What do you think, the way they've rebounded? Well, they play well against ranked teams, and they've showed up. I mean, North Carolina, they beat them. They weren't ranked at the time. They right. beat BYU. They beat Syracuse. They beat Clemson. They played – they gave Ohio State – is that their closest game this year? 21-10, to 10, yeah. Yeah, so they've given and, – and they kept Ohio State in front for the most part. They just – got hit in the mouth in the fourth quarter in that game. So clearly they play up, and and that's my way of saying when they play USC, Trojans better be on alert because they might be 10-1. and one. And they've got, you know, some things with them that uh, they're hard to figure out, Tim. I watched yes. some of them last night, and they, it seems like they're winning by 30, and then all of a sudden Cal's kicking onside kick and makes it a one-score game. So Notre Dame's going to have – Notre Dame's going to be talked about even though they're not going to get anywhere near the playoff because people are going to pair their Clemson, North Carolina, Ohio State is going to use that victory because it's looking better. Um, and, and USC here down the stretch, that'll be a common opponent for several playoff contenders. There's no doubt about it. And Marcus Freeman's got a lot of things figured out. They are building momentum and well, they're going to get to eight, nine wins maybe. Yeah. You know, and I uh, this isn't uh, disparaging because Clemson has played an elite level of football for a long time. Is still playing pretty well this time, but uh, yeah, it, uh, I thought it was the biggest pretender of the unbeaten's left. That's that was my that was my take on Clemson because they just there's there's something missing about that team this year. Is mainly on the offensive side of the ball, in my opinion, from the standpoint of just consistency from the quarterbacking uh, situation. They figured out ways to get by, like Syracuse, et cetera, but. Uh, I just thought that was a tree that was start that was falling a while ago and finally hit the ground. What what what's your take? Yeah, I mean, they people would wanted them to lose. That they, they yeah. want to be in the playoffs. That's the other way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, like the ones the the playoff hopefuls definitely wanted them to lose. And um, you know they they got by against Syracuse with the quarterback switch. I, I was stunned in which the fashion they lost. They, they got blown out and. Uh, you know, Notre Dame took control of that game early, did a, a great job, and uh, obviously probably knocked them out. And um, for Clemson, it's it's there's just something missing there. They, and by something, it's like it's hard to say, well, they had Trevor Lawrence and Deshaun Watson. But I think it's actually on the outside. Where's where's T. Higgins? Where's oh, Justin right. Ross? Where yeah. are those guys that can stretch the field on the outside? They haven't had that the last couple seasons. Yeah, I agree 100%. I mean – Sometimes it's not the guy driving, it's the tires, you know? <laughs> but anyway, uh, well, hey, uh, uh, Bill Bender, hang on a second. I'm going to get to this conversation I had with uh, uh, with Marlon Kerner, former Ohio State uh, star uh, cornerback and longtime NFL pro. NFL pro, that's redundant. Longtime NFL player. And uh, just on Ohio State, what he saw about that. And we even get into a little bit of the national scene, too, because he really keeps up with things. He's one of my favorite guests on here along with Bill Bender of the Sporting News. But here's my conversation with Marlon Kerner. And as promised, as I promised up front, ladies and gentlemen, a return, an encore performance by Marlon Kerner. This is what, your third or fourth or fifth? I think you lose track after a while if you've been on the Tim May podcast. Isn't that right, Marlon? Yeah, I think I lost track, but I appreciate you having me on again. Yeah, and you know why I've got you on. Number one, I like having you on. So, but, And number two... You and I were texting during the middle of the Ohio State at Northwestern game this past Saturday. And as as you pointed out, I'm paraphrasing here because this isn't what you said, but I'm going to paraphrase it. 
been there, done that. Meaning you guys are up there in 1994. Pretty good, pretty good Ohio State team emerging as one of the all-star units of the mid-90s at Ohio State, included like Corey Stringer, uh, yourself. That was your senior year. Uh, Eddie George was just coming into his own as a first year started. Bobby Hoying, second year starter at quarterback. Joey Galloway at wide receiver. Right on down the line, some guys were stepping up. Uh, Mike Vrabel, Matt Finkus were on those teams, that yes. team. You guys trailed nine to nothing at Northwestern. Yeah. Uh, Y'all yeah. end up winning the game 17-15, if memory serves me correctly. I think it does because I looked it up. <laughs> but uh been there done that when it comes to Northwestern that was a much better Northwestern team though I think because they were on their way to going to the Rose Bowl the next year I think you you know and uh and a year after that under Gary Barnett but uh that was the year they were just getting going but uh as you and I were sitting there and we were texting back and forth on Saturday what were you what were you thinking were you thinking this is Ohio this is this is just 2022 Ohio State team's Waterloo or did you figure eventually they'd figure it out. What, what, what were you thinking? Cause this was the midst of that game. Yeah. I mean, I, and, and I think my exact words were, this reminds me of that time we went down there my senior year um, and barely escaped with the victory. Yeah. Uh, we were laughing like, yep. Yep. But for me, I don't think there was any doubt in my mind that Ohio state would win the game on Saturday. I think it was more of a, how would they try to win the game on Saturday? Yeah. And when you started looking at the injury report that came out early and you're like, okay, you're missing this running back and you're missing this person and this person's out. And then you saw the weather and the swirling winds and the rain and knowing that we like to pass the ball. <laughs> I was like, okay, this has a recipe for disaster because. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's like saying a fish likes to drink water. Now go ahead. Right. I was like, okay, which Ohio State team will we see? Will we try to still pass the ball knowing that the weather is not going to cooperate, knowing that the elements is going to make it very difficult, knowing that we like to hold the ball and they're pretty stout. They're pretty solid on defense. So what we try to do, what they should have been doing is trying to overpower, just run the ball, wear them down so that you would kind of, you're setting up the first half to take it, take advantage of the second half, wear them down. We try to throw the ball. And when you have that, you have recipes for disaster. No, you got to give Northwestern a lot of credit because they were effectively running the ball, you know. And, and so when you look at every team, because even in college, every team has like check marks on the board of what they want to do. Keys to winning the game, right? And for no Northwestern, it was going to be control the clock, right? Yep. Minimize turnovers, right? When it's so when the time of possession. Right. And then don't give up any big plays. So yep. you can check, 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 check all those things until late when we were able to pull away. They gave up some big runs and a big and a, a potentially big play pass at the end of the game. But outside of that, they played such a solid game. They had a solid game plan. They played with a lot of emotion, a lot of heart. And it was almost like we were kind of caught off guard of what team we were going to get. Now, I'm not going to say they weren't prepared, but it just seemed like they were caught off guard with the effort and the intensity that Northwestern brought from the beginning. Uh, and it, I think it took them a while to kind of get like, oh, wait a minute, like we're in a dog fight. We need to kind of figure out what we're going to do and how we're going to do this. And once the weather cleared up, they were able to complete some third down passes late. But I mean, when you start looking at what Northwestern did, almost 50% on third down compared to us, we had like four, four out of 15 or something mm -hmm. like that. Like, yeah, that, that sets up a recipe for being able to control the clock and really put your offense in some good positions. But you know what? When you take a fighter and he's like the, you know, the coolest fighter, you know, let's, let's say Muhammad Ali versus uh, uh, some not not quite can of corn he fought, but not definitely not Joe Frazier, but against yeah. an average kind of boxer, maybe lesser boxer. But then you take uh, Muhammad Ali and you tie one arm behind his back. OK, now fight this fight. OK, the other guy, you're not going to. Defend yourself as well. You're not going to be as aggressive offensively because you got one arm tied behind your back. I'm not giving Ohio State an excuse or a pass at all, but that was what it was like watching Ohio State uh, in that game. Throughout that game, when you consider the passing game was literally taken from them by Mother Nature. Mother Nature chose sides. She chose uh, uh, Northwestern. She put up a 25 to 40 mile an hour wind consistently. Throughout that game, you could see even on television, I didn't get to go to that game because I had a 
a positive test in the middle of the week last week. I'll be back in action again this week. Uh, you know what I mean by positive test. I don't want to go there. But the bottom line is you could see even on television the ball moving. You could see uh, sure-handed receivers throughout this season putting their hands up to where they think the ball is going to be. And I'm talking about when the ball is like 10 feet from them, and you can see it move, and they don't get that clear clear catch. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And they don't get the catch. I mean, it happened to, it happened to Mecca Ibuka. It happened to uh, Cade Stover. Uh, my point is, now you now you're now you're taking this team that's used to fighting with both hands, and now all you have is your left jab and an uppercut. Go after them. And Ohio State, as much as they want to be considered, and we all want to look at them as supermen, this kind of team. No, you, there are some things you do better than others. No matter how much you emphasize the other thing, the Ohio State running game definitely. Took a while to get going to get the right tires on it, you know, for the race, so to speak. And then the Ohio State defense took a few series to kind of get things figured out. Uh, I think you agree with that because they weren't quite as solid defensively as they have been even against the run. But once they figured out how to keep uh, linebackers from getting on to Steel Chambers and Tommy Eichenberg, which they definitely did after halftime, it was a different ball game, right? And and sometimes it just takes a while, right? Like with you guys, y'all were down nine nothing uh, at halftime in that game. You're right. That's what it is. Sometimes you just the game plan you have going into it doesn't necessarily mean that's the best game plan for yeah. that day. And Saturday's game plan, you could tell what we thought we were going to be able to do on Saturday was not going to be effective for what the elements were bringing to us, how Northwestern wanted to try to play us. And so our house state's always been a really good team of making second half adjustments. And that's what you saw. Like, hey, we thought we could do this. We thought we could do this. We thought they were going to do this on offense. They did this. Okay, we need to regroup. Let's put a pause in it. We're, we're okay. We're going to come back. We still got a second half to play. And I think they did a really good job on Saturday of making the right adjustments for the second half and putting their players in the best situation to make plays. And, you know, Mother Nature did cooperate a little bit um, in the second half and allowed us to pass a little bit more. But I think one of the things that we have to kind of say is we we need to be able to say we we have to start quicker. And I think that was one of the biggest things that really allowed Northwestern on Saturday to believe that they still had a chance as we left them stay in the game for so long. We just, we couldn't figure it out. So I, I love that we we're great at making adjustments when we get to halftime, we have to be able to make in-game adjustments on the fly to say, okay, they're doing this, they're doing that. We need to do this because you can't start slow and wait until the second half to say, maybe our run game will come together. We're going to do this against a really, really good explosive team because then you're going to be behind the eight ball and you have to get away from certain things that you're really good at doing. So we need to be better at starting fast. Yeah, you're exactly right. And boy, when you don't, when you get the ball first and you don't go down and score and then they get the ball and they go down and score with this variety of things, but mainly obviously running the ball, a few short passes, et cetera. They jump into the wildcat, uh, you know, what you knew was coming. Right. right. Uh, I think they call it actually the Northwestern cat. I may be wrong since they are the wildcats or the us cat, but they right. jump into the wildcat and I'll, you know, and, and they made it look so seriously, so thorough, so uh, efficient and so easy on that touchdown drive. You're going, Oh my goodness. Somebody woke up. Somebody didn't. Uh, somebody had what they wanted for breakfast. Somebody didn't. Somebody, when they got out of bed, the weather was, quite favorable to what they had in mind today of uh, upsetting their number two team in the country. And the other team thought, well, you know what? We're still the biggest, baddest, whatever from the big 10 East, we're going to take care of business anyway and got slapped in the face. Right. I mean, right. it does. People don't like to hear that. Sometimes they, they just want to think of these of uh, the college football teams or NFL teams. Even you played in the NFL for, for years uh that y'all just stick a, a key in the slot and turn the key and the motor comes on on your machine and you are what you are absolutely not right right week in and week out is different and i think what you're going to see and this is something that ohio state really has to really get in their mindset you're always going to get everyone's best you're the number two team in the country you're not going to sneak up on anybody nobody's going to be like oh man like what ohio state team are we going to get no this is the number two team in the nation if we knock them off, this can be a season-changing game for us. It can get some coaches' extensions. It'll get a, a quarterback. Hey, you can get another start. You can get the rest of the season because of how you played against the number two team in the nation. So they have to understand that you're always going to get the best. You have to come and match intensity. Really, you have to overpower and, and, and really give more intensity than what the team is going to give you. And Northwestern came out like, 
look, this is this was everything was for the making of a upset of a number two team in the country. The weather wasn't cooperating. Like you didn't come out with the right intensity to match what they were going to give you. They were keeping it low scoring. They had 16 more minutes of time of possession against you. 50% on third down, no turnovers. Like, like those are all the things that you want. No really big plays, nothing that would really say, we've got to get out of this cover too. No, they kept their safeties back. They yeah. came they hit hard. Their linebackers were flying around. Everything was contested. It was really a chore for Ohio State to move the ball and do what they were able to do in that first half on Saturday. And it and it put the it put Northwest in the position to say, hey, we've got Ohio State on the ropes. And like you said, as a boxer, you can rope it up all you want. Muhammad Ali was, was great at that, right? You can play it, lay on the ropes all you want. But if I only got two punches, that's pretty easy to figure out what you're going to do. So thankfully, the second half adjustments got that hand loose and they were able to kind of say, okay, we're going to pull CJ out, let him do some bootlegs and kind of pull it out and run that little read option. And he he made some plays with his legs that really helped cement the game for them on Saturday. And it was impressive to watch because he's not known as a runner, but <laughs> we've got to start a lot faster and be a lot better um, when we come and play opponents. These last few games are going to be really critical to see where we are. The silver lining, you just touched on it, the silver lining from that cloud. And, you know, they still won by two touchdowns. They still right. set a record for most most games consecutively with 20 or more points scored, which is 70. Uh, in the FBS, uh, that's crazy. They've got that's 70 crazy. straight games of 20 more points. That's something to, to hold, hang your hat on, even though it's like half of what, at least half of what people thought you would get on Saturday. And that's the other thing, by the way, uh, I was even big up to this. Uh, I uh, downplayed uh, Northwestern only because they were one and seven, only because of the, you know, the real easy tagline, they hadn't won a game this year, still haven't on American soil. You know, they beat uh, Nebraska, uh that's how bad Scott Frost was. They beat Nebraska uh, at, in, Ireland. Uh, in Dublin, Dublin, Ireland uh, for the season over. You remember that? But, yes. but but I was guilty of like, you know, degrading them from the standpoint of maybe uh, as, as being a bad a team. As I remember when I first started covering this team back in the late 80s or mid 80s, uh, being that kind of Northwestern. Now, that team had a lot of fight in it. Number two, they played some really close games. Could have beaten Maryland. You know, they had, I mean, there were there were all these reasons why if you'd look deeper, you would have seen they were going to be more competitive. But then when you throw, like you said, tie one arm behind Ohio State's uh back and make it beat you, well, Ohio State still beat them, you know. Ohio right. State took a took a beating, but still won the fight. You know what I mean? I mean, I guess the best way of putting it. And like you just said, but the silver lining is uh oh, CJ Stroud can run the ball. C.J. Stroud did run the ball. Now, he didn't exactly look like J.T. Barrett running the ball or Braxton Miller or, uh, you know, I mean, he's not exactly going to plow over people. But, oh, no. my goodness, his two big runs were as big a plays as there were in that game. I think you agree with me on that fourth down play where he goes 16 yards or, or down the right sideline before I State's last touchdown, 44 yards. Those were huge, weren't they? Huge, huge plays. I mean, and and take that away. I mean, you talk, may be talking about – that 70 game streak comes to an end. So they, they yeah. don't get the number 70 because it was looking very close. Like, I don't know, like, what are you going to do on that fourth down play? Like you have to convert this. And I did not think that he was going to pull that out. I kept looking like they've got the bootleg. They could, they could pull CJ, but that's not what we do. And it was a perfect call for then. And I think it sets up for later on in the season. Now teams are going to have to play it honest because you have on film, Hey, he can run this. So I can't just collapse on my running back. So I think that will open up lanes when you really need to say, I'm going to hand the ball off to Henderson or Williams, say, we're, we're going to do this read. Hey, who are you going to collapse on? Because if I don't take the quarterback, he's capable of taking it 40, 50 yards uh, and making a big play for the Buckeyes. But yeah, yeah. you know, it, it's one thing you, you were talking about, you know, we all downplayed and somebody was like, hey, you think Ohio State is going to beat them like that? I'm like, you know, I don't like to jinx anybody, but I'm like, history tells me Northwestern is always going to play us tough. They always come out with a lot of intensity. So you just got you in in your mindset as as young buck guys, you got to understand like it doesn't matter what the spread says, it doesn't matter what the record is. You have to know that there are certain teams that just want it more. And and Fitzgerald is one of those guys who's it's an easy sell as a coach. Yeah. We're one and seven. We're the underdogs. They're coming here. They're supposed to beat us by forty nine. Let's go take the fight to them. They don't know what it's about. They're about to get. They can't pass the ball in this weather. 
Let's cut off all the running lanes and see if they see what they're going to do. Let's punch them in the mouth. Like I can envision the speech he's giving them right now. Yeah, that, oh yeah. He was giving them on Saturday at the locker room, like we're going to take it to them and let's see what happens. And for the most part of the game, they held strong to that game plan. And you could see that Ohio State on paper and personnel wise still had way more players that were better on both sides of the ball. And that was really the difference. They were able to find ways to get their playmakers the ball in critical situations. And then Northwestern couldn't. They didn't have enough. They didn't have enough forces on the other side of the ball on offense or defense to make the stops when needed. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, you just know he gave that exact same speech at halftime, too, because it's 7 7. I mean, right. number two team in the country. They come out and they get a decent drive going. And I, if I remember correctly, they went for it on fourth down, didn't get it. You know, Ohio State went down and scored. And I'm thinking, okay, this isn't going to be 50 to 7, but this could be 35 to 7 uh, by the time this thing is over. Because number right. one, Ohio State had the wind at its back at that point. But it only got the wind at its back a few times because of the way Northwestern was able to, if not score, at least eat clock, right? I wonder what clock right. tastes like. You put a little salt and pepper on it. What do you think you put on it? You know, you throw it in a crock pot. You put a little, a little broth in there. Let it just go ahead and marinate Soften. for a long time. Take six, eight hours and let that stuff cook. And it tastes great. I mean, yeah. it was a perfect game plan. Run the ball. Keep it third and manageable. Third and four to five year, five yards. And we can either run it, we can pass it. Their running backs ran hard. I mean, it was it was oh, yeah. a classic, classic beatdown by Northwestern on Saturday. But luckily, the Buckeyes still came out victorious, and we've got some things to work on. But yeah, I, mean, I was sitting there watching him like this is reminds me. It was so eerie, and I think for us, it came down to a two point conversion that yeah. I missed. I, I came across and swiped down instead of sticking my hand out and just missed the ball, and he caught it. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. And so they got the touchdown. We stopped the two-point conversion. Or, and that's how we ended up winning 17-15 to 15, uh, my senior year. And it was just same thing against us. Wins were a little crazy. Couldn't really run the ball like we wanted to. Passing game wasn't effective. We ha I had a 15-yard penalty doing something silly, throwing somebody out of bounds. Yes, I remember that. So I'm sorry, Buckeye Nation, for doing that. Man, it must have been really – I mean, I think I remember that, but it must have been really egregious because back then you could throw them into the stands and nobody cared. <laughs> <laughs> I, was probably, I was probably five yards out of bounds when I tossed him in. And it wasn't even like a flagrant toss. It was just, we were out of bounds and I had him up and I was just like, and I tossed him and I, I just yeah. lost track of where I was and just kind of did a little toss to the side. And he just, he sold it very well. Oh yeah. He did the whole spin out of bounds and the rest like, you know, and, and coach Cooper pulled me aside. Like, Hey, I'm like, coach, like, you know, you're telling me, I'm like, I coach, I, you know what? I just, I lost track of where I was. It won't happen again. But yeah. you know, those are things you, you can't do. Um, when you want to beat teams that you're supposed to beat. and But those are also things that you do that allow teams that are trying to keep the momentum or trying to find ways to scrap along and try to get an upset. Those are plays that help keep those those teams in the game. And yeah. that's yeah. how they stayed in the game so long with us. Yeah. And by the way, you know, you should have remembered Northwestern has quite the theatrical school up there, you know, the school of theater. Yeah, so, you know, those guys know how to act, so to speak. You know, it's funny. Hey, Marlon, before we move on a couple other things, what's funny is – uh. It, you know, when Pat Fitzgerald and uh, Ryan Day met at midfield, it's almost like you could see Fitzgerald, who I like a lot, Coach Fitz. Uh, uh, you could almost see like he was almost saying to him, hey, we gave you a scare there, didn't we? You know, or, hey, how do you like our, our 12th man, Mother Nature? We've got her, you know, it was actually 12th woman, Mother Nature. I mean, uh, she really came for, through for us today. But you could see there was a little bit of lightheartedness there, at least on Fitz, Coach Fitz's part. But what does a team get from this? Because, you know, I don't mean to bring up a really bad memory, but I think was it the next week y'all went to Penn State in '94? <laughs> uh, if it wasn't the next week, it was the following week. Yeah, we we, Remember, we I saw a bus of a really good team at Penn State. Yeah, I called it the Black Sox scandal because a, a, a lot of guys wore black socks as a sh show of unity. And then remember, y'all had beaten Penn State the week the the year before their first game in the Big Ten against you guys, and man, and. Uh, Man, 63 to 14, I bet that still stings a little bit, doesn't it? Oh, that stings a lot. I mean, when, when you think about that game, I somebody was like, what is it like to play down there? Like, yeah, yeah, you don't – the whiteout, the whiteout is real. Like, when, when, when they're rolling and hitting on all cylinders, it's a very formidable place to play. It's loud. Um, you hear that little Nittany Lion roar. Little. Roar, and it's like – I'm like, I'm so tired of hearing this thing. They played it so much. You know, it, it was just one of those things where – and I think it was close. Like it was like a 14-3 um, or 17-3 at the end of the first where you're like, okay, we're in striking distance. It was a gorgeous day. 
we did all wear black socks. Um, and, and so that was kind of one of the, one of the scandals there. Uh, and then from there, they scored 21 points in the, in the second quarter. And it went from being 14 to three to like 35, 30, 30 uh, 42 to three at the half. And it was just, yeah, that was it. You just, it was a bus off. You had Kajana, you had oh. great, you had, you had so many weapons all over the place and they ran all over us. They passed the ball on us. They had Bobby Ingram, the tight end, um, the receiver that had a, uh, the tight end that was there. Uh, I mean, it was just, yeah. they, they were loaded. They had a really good squad, you know, and, and they, they did everything right. They attacked us the way they should have attacked us. Uh, and we just could not stop the onslaught. And, and, and if I was them, I wouldn't have put my foot off the break. And I still don't know how that team did not win the national championship because Hands down, that was the best team in college football the year. I don't care who they voted for, who the AP voted for. There was no way that that Penn, that Penn State team should not have won the national championship that year. You know, just like everybody's discounting Ohio State right now because of a, a so-called lackluster performance at Northwestern, lackluster as in the final score, they had one of those uh, a couple of weeks later. I'm talking about that Penn State did, team did at Indiana. They yes. didn't win as big as everybody thought to. Of course, that was back in the poll era. You know, they there was no – even, even the BCS, there was no BCS. There was no way to get it back. Once you slipped from one to two or three, you were kind of done for unless number one slipped up, you know, and that's exactly, I agree with you about that Penn State team. That was as good a, a good a team as has come along in the Big Ten in the last 30 years, in my opinion, just from a total balance offense, defense, able to get after you with the passing game and the running game. Uh, that was when Joe Paul let it all hang loose, you know. He uh, did. But, it been, but go, going back to that, what I'm getting to here is, what is a lesson that you think these players at Ohio State would have learned from Saturday's games? Twenty-one to seven, you still win by uh, by fourteen points, double digits. Uh, but you do, do you feel a little more humble now? What 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 do you, what do you think they're feeling uh, going into this week's game, next to last home game this week against Indiana, uh, a team that just got bushwhacked, of course, by uh, Penn State? But uh, what 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 does that? Because obviously. I'm not sure if you guys learned a lesson or not from that close call at Northwestern or whether, you know, some teams have to find their depth before they rise. You know what I mean? I don't know. But what what would you – I guess what do you think the lesson was learned for this team or what is the lesson that should have been learned on Saturday? I think the lesson learned is, you, one, which they did, no matter what, you have to find a way to win games. Uh, and so you can't control the weather. You can't control – what Northwestern calls, but you can control how you respond and how you play your responsibilities. And so I think they, in the second half, they did a really good job of making the adjustments and really responding to what they were seeing um, on the field. Uh, th secondly, hopefully they learned that you're always going to get every team's best. Like you're, you're the Ohio State University. You're the number two team in the nation. So teams, are, you're going to get everybody's best. They're going to bring another level of effort that, you may not have seen before. So you have to come with so much effort, so much intensity. Your mind has got to be, we've got to hit them in the mouth. We've got to start fast now because we want to take the crowd out of it. We want to take them out of it. We want them to see that it doesn't matter what you bring and how you come. We're going to bring that much more intensity. We're going to match what you bring to us and give it, give you more than what you can handle. And then we're going to continue to play and play and play because that's it. Like teams are going to, they're not going to stop. Like this is not going to be one of those, oh, we score first. Oh, they scored. The game's over. No, they're going to keep fighting. They're going to give you for four quarters. So you need to match that intensity for the full fourth quarters. Uh, and then I think playing in elements like that, because you don't always get to play that in Columbus and other places. So playing in elements like that on Saturday where the wind can really impact you, it changes what you want to do. Um, I think for CJ and the receivers, they learn what it's what it's like to really catch the ball in difficult situations, really understand how to run routes, how to be precise in where I need to be, how the ball is going to how the wind will take and shape the way the ball is going to carry to you. Yeah. Um, for CJ, it's you got to drive the ball, keep the nose down, can't let it get up and all those things that you don't really get a chance to practice all the time. So you just need game time experience to figure it out because you will have other games where the elements will play play a role in whether you can win or lose. And you have to figure out how to overcome and play in those elements. Yeah, and the other thing, and the coaching staff, you know, uh, Ohio State practice, you know, Ryan Day has talked about this. They practice in the wind a lot because there's you never know when there's going to be a day like that. But this wasn't wind. This was like top. This was wind, but it was it was extended wind at 20, 20 to 30 miles an hour with gusts, you know, 
this was not your your 15 mile an hour wind in Ohio Stadium that with with uh, swirls and everything. This wind was pretty much out of the south, blew and blowing due north. Uh, when you were going with the wind, the ball was going to take off on you. When you're going into it, it wasn't going to go exactly where you were throwing it, no matter who you are, you know, because the gust may not hit it or it might, you know. I mean, my point is, I, I I fault Ohio State, I fault Ryan Day and the offensive staff for not adjusting and just going, hey, let's get two tight ends in there almost all day. Now, they did end up doing that to a certain extent. Maybe get three tight ends in there all day and have one wide out just to throw them off balance. But let's go. Let's. We are the better team. We are the stronger team. Let's shove them down the field. And uh, there was too much even wide stuff there early in that game. It it boggled me how long it kind of took them to realize, hey, you're not going to be landing at this airport today. You got to come in by land. You know what I mean? You got to take Absolutely. a bus, right? Right. And my my analogies are going crazy right now. Uh, but don't you agree? It took them a. In my in my opinion, it took them too long. What 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 was your what was your thought on just from an offensive standpoint, how long it took them to figure out you can't throw the ball today? I, I would agree. I, I thought coming in, you saw like, hey, like I thought going in as as a and being around college football and, and professional football, you always kind of have like, all right, well, if the weather comes into play, then we're going to do act. We have our set of plays and formations will run. Mm -hmm. I agree. I, I thought they took too long to get to. Look, you need to go big. You need to go two tight ends. Uh, go. You, you sometimes go in that eye if you want to go with double receivers. You can go with the uh, eye. You can do all kind of things that you want to do. You can go offset, near, far, all those type of formations yeah. to kind of say they've got go it. They've got that. Yeah. They have all that. And so you needed to take a page and go really old school and go a la Woody Hayes and just like, look, we're gonna go three yards in a cloud of dust because you can't pass and run this four wide set, three wide set that you wanted to do and throw the passes that we are accustomed to seeing Ohio State throw. And I think it set CJ and them up for some some failure because you're trying to throw the ball and the ball's going this way. Uh, and so it played into Northwestern's hand. And I think in the second half, they realized like, listen, coach, we need to get out of this and go to this. And that's when they really started having more success. You started seeing uh, yeah. Williams get more more comfortable in the running scheme and what they were running because they were getting the big bodies in and then they started imposing their will at the end. Um, but yeah, you're right. I, I thought after the first quarter, you better bring in some double, some two tight, some three tight and just start pounding the ball down Northwestern's throat and saying, okay, listen, this may not be a 49 to 14 win or a 56 to seven win, but if we can get 28 points or 35 points out of it by just grounding up the clock and having a lot more running yards than they have, then that's a victory we'll take. And and you're going to have games where you just have to say, we well, you know what, we can't pass. We're going to we're gonna run the ball. You know we're going to run the ball. Let me see if you can stop us because teams are going to load the box at, when, when you need to run the ball. And so that would have been really good practice for them to see. And, and they did it well in the second half, but definitely I would say probably a little too late of adjustment. Hey, last thing uh, on that yard, and I want to ask you one more thing. Uh, Mayan Williams, I give this guy kudos. I mean, he fell into the yard marker at Penn State in the first half the week before hurt his arm, hurt his wrist. You know, the second half of that game, he had his arm in a sling, you know. Right. Well, Trevion Henderson couldn't even make the trip. He's got, I think, like a toe sprain, foot sprain kind of thing that he's dealt with all, been dealing with all year. And he got the feeling that must be what sidelined him uh, for this game, couldn't even make the trip. Their next back would going to be Dallin Hayden, a freshman. Well, I think he's played well when he's been in there, run hard. Uh, and then Chip Trainum, the kid who transferred – from Arizona State back here was a running back at Arizona State, has been practicing at linebacker, wanted to play linebacker at Ohio State, but now they only play two linebackers a game. Uh, well, they moved him back to running back a couple of weeks ago, almost full time. So he was number three, but they never got to two and three. If they slipped in there, I never saw him. Uh, but my point is, Mayan Williams answered the bell and continued to answer the bell on Saturday. As a former player who – played in the upper level of both major college and uh, the NFL. Do you give that man kudos considering the way he left the game the week before? Absolutely. You know, that, that goes to the preparation that he's, he put into the off season to get to this point. Um, and then just him being able to go in and get the treatment necessary to come in and play. And then mentally you're like, all right, how do I fall? Like all those things that yeah. we don't think about that you don't think about as, as somebody as on a Saturday where you're like, all right, if, if this is the elbow and I get hit here, I've got to be able to figure out how to roll this way, get out of bounds this way, so I don't really put it in harm's way. He's done an amazing job of just being available for most of the season. I think what he missed one game so far this season. Yeah. Uh, but outside of that, I mean, he carried the load. 
he's been definitely the the strongest back that we've had so far this season. The one who, when you need somebody to make the tough run, you like, I'm going to give it to him. Um, and I think once uh, Henderson kind of comes back from that injury, because I've had that before in high school, you know, you know, people think like, oh, it's just a toe. Like, no, yeah. <laughs> depending on which toe it is, like if it's the big toe, that's the one to cut. It, it's everything, like your weight, your cutting, everything for a running back. Uh, so I can understand the amount of pain that he might be in and why it's taking, and those injuries take forever to heal because every time you plant and do something on it, you just re aggravate it. So it's just trying to, can you get it to calm down? Can I walk back to the sideline and be like, okay, let's go. So hopefully he can get healthy for the last part of the season uh, when we're really going to need him against that team up North. Uh, and then for the big, um, the possible big 10 champ, the big 10 championship, and then whatever happens uh, in the playoffs, depending on how the rest of the season shakes out. All right. You just let me know my last question, dude. I've, I've seen some wild college football seasons, but this is one of them. This is going to be one of those ones where, you know, when, when I'm old, I'm 68 now, when I'm really old uh, and when you're old, when you finally get old, People are going to be talking about this season. We saw it on Saturday. Number 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 one goes down. Number three, Georgia beats them, beats them, puts a thumping on them early, like you wanted Ohio State to start on Saturday, on Saturday, and then kind of hangs on to what 27-13, wherever the final score was. Georgia over Tennessee, uh, the darling of the of the year so far uh, was Tennessee, and then Alabama. You know, Alabama could be sitting on four losses right now, but it took its second loss and it took overtime to do it in the, one of the toughest places to play in America. Uh, hell, one of the toughest places to play in the world, I would think. Yeah, uh, Tiger Stadium down there in Baton Rouge, but LSU upsets Alabama, and now all of a sudden things are topsy turvy. And everybody was at three thirty on Saturday. Everybody's talking about Ohio State, and oh my goodness, they're going to plummet in the poll. Blah blah blah. Ohio State ends up number two in the AP poll this week. You know, the first one I saw come out because of all this other stuff that happened, right? So, absolutely. One thing is make sure you win before anything else, right? I mean, but just. Right. Well, what's the, what's the lesson you learned from this past weekend? You know, you can't take anything uh, for granted. Uh, and and yes, we didn't play our best game on Saturday, but we won, right? And then because because the season is so topsy turvy and everything is just out of whack, and at this point, I don't think anybody would have said Alabama would have two losses, uh, and people wouldn't have said. You know, I I was looking forward to that that clash between Tennessee and Georgia, who was really good. I thought Georgia was the better team. And I'm like, okay, so Georgia proved it. Uh, I did not see Clemson going down to Notre Dame and getting manhandled the way they did. Like Notre Dame really yeah. ran the ball. I mean, they physically imposed their will on, on Clemson. I didn't even mention Clemson. Yeah, you're and right. I'm like, whoa, like it was um, it was pretty amazing to watch because I'm I'm looking like, oh, well, if Ohio State does drop, because I, I thought, all right, if everyone wins, definitely Ohio State drops. But once you start seeing like, hey, this one lost and this one lost and this one. Oh, well, Ohio State may not drop too far. Definitely there's going to be some teams that move up for certain. But, you know, the th the name of the game is win out. Because if you win out, you still get to control your own destiny. Um, It doesn't matter. And that's what I would tell the players. And I'm sure that's what Coach Day is telling all the players. Like, it doesn't matter what comes out, where the ranking has you. Just take care of business week in and week out. Because the only thing that matters is the final poll. Uh, and so if you, if you go undefeated and you win all your games, you're going to be where you want to be. You're going to get a chance to control your destiny. And that's all that you really want as a player is this, if you can control your own destiny and say, we're going to sell it on the field and not hope that somebody votes one way or the other. Um, you don't want help. You don't want to try to get help to get into the, get into the, the, the dance, so to speak. So you just want to be able to win out and control your destiny. And I think they put themselves in a good position to still be able to do that. Yeah. Uh, real quick. Uh, who's your, do you have a top four right now? If you were on the college football playoff committee, you pay enough attention because you even brought up Clemson. I didn't forget about Clemson Notre Dame. I kind of did because I got caught up in my other analogies. Who would be who would be your college football playoff top four this week, Arnold? Absolutely, Georgia would be number one. Um, you can flip a coin. You can put uh, the Buckeyes at two or three. Um, I would probably put them at two because everyone else below them pretty much lost. Georgia's going to leapfrog them. Uh, you go to three, you have to say that team up north would probably be three. You almost uh, said it. <laughs> you know, I, and then four, I guess really you would kind of, I, I would probably take what the AP has now. I would probably give it to, who was that, TCU? Um, yeah. I would put TCU. You you could make an argument that somebody from the Pac-12 could be there, but really, I mean, I would probably put TCU there um, and then leave it at that. So it'll be interesting to see how they, where where they put Alabama. Because I'm curious to see where they play Alabama with two yeah. losses in the division. 
um, how far they drop it because you still want to make sure that the schedule looks good uh, for the rest of those SEC teams. So they're going to make yeah. sure that Alabama doesn't drop too far. Yeah, it'll be curious to see where they put Tennessee, for example. Will they put Tennessee over TCU? You know, they had they had uh, TCU behind uh, what behind uh, Alabama and uh, Alabama and Michigan last week, obviously. Right. Uh, but uh, TCU just figures out ways to win games, man. I mean, that, there, there's something to be said for that. I mean, Ohio State did that in 2002 and won a national championship. So, you know, we'll see where it goes. But I, right. I, I think your top four is pretty solid. But it, like you said, will they discount TCU again and give Tennessee the benefit of the doubt? Well, they did beat Alabama. Well, so did LSU. Texas almost beat Alabama. Texas a and almost beat Alabama. True. Don't don't tell me Alabama anymore. Granted, it was overtime. They still got beat, you know. And yeah. uh, well, you imagine that town right now. I, I grew up in Alabama and in Texas. I can imagine. I'm just asking you, but uh, that town is so so revolved. Oh, they're upset state, right so now. Like, they're right like now. two losses. Oh my! They're they're ready to something's wrong. Like, yeah. And, and I, I would say Saban Saban's in a good spot because he's always known to kind of like, they always have like a year where it's just like, this is not your typical yes. Alabama football team. They win, they win, they win. They kind of have a down year. And then all of a sudden they come back and go on this incredible streak of national championship, playing a yeah. national championship, national championship, playing in that. And you're like, okay, so hopefully it's not the beginning of one of those streaks going forward, but yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's a down year. I mean, teams are definitely playing Alabama tougher. Uh, and I thought Georgia, hands down, was still going to be probably the team to come out of that that the SEC as being the top dog coming out of there. Yeah, well, we'll see, Marlon. You look a lot you look a lot closer to that fruition than you did a week ago. I picked Tennessee to go down there and win, and that's how wrong I was. They put a knot up on their head and then uh, and just sat there and looked at them and laughed at them. But uh, that sure is did. what it is. Marlon Kerner, once again, thanks for joining the Tim May podcast, my man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Man, I always appreciate having Marlon Kerner on my podcast. Uh, he does his homework, as I said, going into it and and uh, has some good takes. And like he talked about there, Bill Bender, uh, you know, he's top four probably uh, this week. Uh, we record this before the college football playoff rankings come out. But, uh, you know, Georgia, probably Ohio State, Michigan. He doesn't say Michigan, but I I said the word. He doesn't say it being a former Buckeye, uh, Buckeye player. And then uh, TCU, uh, do you agree with that uh, this week? Yeah, and I don't think there'll be much drama to it. I will be surprised if they don't put TCU four. I mean, I think one, two, three's good. I mean, I think Georgia, you can't – you can say Ohio State's number one, but I think Georgia just – they made their case Saturday. That defense – I mean, holding Tennessee to 289 total yards. Yep. And now, really, if you're Ohio State, the two games I'm kind of – and I, I know Ryan – Coach Day would – hate to hear this because we're not supposed to look ahead but it's okay to kind of for us we're allowed to we're not in the well, yeah we can put the we, periscope we up and look. But, yeah um so looking and, and kind of okay what's it going to look like against michigan and then what's it going to look like against georgia that's that's what i've been doing all year um i think georgia's got some really interesting pieces on their defense especially up front jalen carter is a uh, a beast he, he's a problem and the way that they made Hendon Hooker look bad quickly what was very interesting to me. But their offense isn't quite as dynamic as Ohio State. So, you know, that's the matchup I thought – that's a matchup I wanted to see last year. And yeah. we didn't get to see it. So, yeah. um, that that's one. But there's a long way to get there. And then TCU at four makes sense to me. I'm wondering if they'll get cute and put, like, Tennessee and not penalize them as much or – I don't think they can put Oregon ahead of Tennessee because we saw Georgia blow out Oregon and Tennessee two touchdown loss. It it was that one though, to me, Tim was worse than the score. And I think TCU should be rewarded for what they've done to this point. I agree a hundred percent. But like you just said, I, it's going to really going to be eye opening about this committee. If they have Tennessee sitting there four uh, on Tuesday, instead of TCU, because TCU is one, you know, has beaten ranked teams. I mean, some of those teams aren't ranked anymore, but they've beaten ranked teams, they've, and they figured out a way to come from behind in almost every one of those games. You know, that's something you can hold against them. But the point is, at this point, it's the W, right? Ohio State, let me tell you, Ryan Day was the happiest man, well, along with C.J. Stroud and the players, but Ryan Day was the happiest man uh, in Evanston 
uh, Illinois the other night when that when that clock hit zero and they were up 21-7. Uh, he took that and got out of town, I'm sure, quick, especially with that tailwind, right? Well, nobody nobody's going to remember that game if they win the national Correct. title. They're just going to say they played in a – now, for, for I think them, one of the things that I've kind of sketched this out, they have found – he talked about this when I went to the Wisconsin game, which is what they've found multiple ways to win. Yes. It doesn't have to be CJ Stroud for 501 game. It doesn't have to be the defense giving up the defense still doing pretty well. A little bit of a concern that Northwestern was able to run a little bit on them, but that's big 10 football. It's going to happen. Um, and again, like as far as the rest of the big 10 race goes, it is okay. What are you going to do this week to beat Indiana? They'll take care of business there. The Maryland road trip, is not as easy as it looks. Nope. You know what I mean? Because they've got yep. some guys on the perimeter that will test them. And then Michigan, of course, it's Ohio State's strengths. We're going to find out how much stronger they are. Michigan's just just running through people with a old-school bulldozer running attack. I know they were behind against Rutgers at halftime, but no, nobody in their right mind thought, thought that Scarlet Knights were going to win that game. Greg Chiano had one of the great quotes. They interviewed him as he's going off the field and on the tele, telecast, and I retweeted it to everybody. Uh, uh, he goes, no, they, nobody gives you – you don't get trophies for uh, for leading a half. You know what I mean? And right. uh, he was exactly – they never scored again. <laughs> so, uh, you're right. I mean, I think the Michigan-Ohio State collision. But here's – last thing I want to leave here with. Is there enough – do you think there will be enough – powder in that cannon for a two sec two big 10 college football playoff uh uh what do you call it bracket uh if ohio state let's say edges michigan and then wins the big 10 and georgia hangs on and it beats maybe lsu or whomever in the uh sec championship game for georgia tennessee uh, Ohio State and Michigan to make the Final Four, and that, have, and including they, TCU winning out. Go ahead. Well, if TCU wins out, I think they'll get in. But if TCU loses to Texas this weekend, it opens up some very interesting possibilities for those four teams. Who I still think the four best teams in the country. I, I the rankings. That's who deserves to be the four best teams, and I'm cool with it. But I still think Tennessee is better than TCU. Yeah, I think Tennessee would win if they played TCU. Yeah. But this isn't a hypothetical matchup. So, but why can't Ohio State and Michigan both be in the conversation? They they have dominated for the most part this season. They both I, they they don't control their schedule. I mean, Ohio State from their standpoint, the Notre Dame victory looks good. They went into Penn State and won. They uh, have Michigan on the resume. Everything's in front of them. Michigan, they I know their non conference schedule was really bad, but dominated Penn State dominated michigan state dominate they, if they dominate illinois that's another ranked victory yeah and an opportunity to go win at ohio state for the first time since 2000 if they played like a oh, i don't know like a 35 31 game that was one possession either way to me they would both still deserve to be in the conversation so real quick for to sum up you've still got game of the century deuce or game of the century two uh, you still see it coming, right? Ohio State versus Michigan, just like 2006. I, I'm sure there have been other games of the century since then. <laughs> but you know what right. I'm talking about. Uh, yeah, I mean, a close a close finish there. I would not be surprised to see two and two uh, going in because the committee, that would be an easy thing for them to fix. Uh, Georgia one, uh, Ohio State two, uh, Tennessee three, Michigan four. Then they're not playing each other until maybe the championship game. Right. And, and you know, it it could happen. I mean, yeah. I, I think all of these things could happen if they got all four of those teams in. I think, you know, we are headed towards something similar to 2006. I don't know if it'll be the same, but, you know, you've been in the press box for that one. We were both in there for 2016, which to me was the I'm trying to think of the Harbaugh versus Ohio State matchups. The 2016 matchup is the best one. Yeah. Since 2006. But yeah, yeah, this one by this much. By and, this um, much. <laughs> yes, uh, we made a t shirt with that. They sold a lot of t shirts with that. Yeah. And um, I was the question after that, Tim. So after he did that, I was like the next one. Yeah. And, um, I was just thinking, just ask, ask something very general or you're going to get your head bit off. And uh, 
Uh, I said something like, I actually do want to remember what I asked. I said, are these the two best teams in the Big Ten? And he goes, I have no idea. So it could be a similar situation where the loser gets asked that question where are these the two best teams in the Big Ten? Are these the ones that deserve to be in the playoff? And I I definitely think there's a case uh, for both, no matter what happens. That's why the Big Ten appears to be hurtling toward a no divisional format, which I'm not a fan of. I don't think it's – you know, I don't want to see Ohio State and like we talked about before. I don't want to see Ohio State and Michigan play one week and then play again the next week. You know, the two best teams in the league playing for the Big Ten championship. If in fact they keep the championship game, I uh, I don't want to see that. But we may be hurtling toward that, Bill. But I definitely I'm want agree to... with you. I don't know why people. I, I've had this conversation. I may have to call you about. This I know what you're fixed to tell me. Go ahead. Yeah, the um, more Michigan Ohio State is not necessarily a good thing for me. No. I want that game to matter. I don't care that they – if they play in the playoff at some point when they go 12, that's fine. They, but it's – the regular season game, there's nothing that holds a candle to it. I'm sorry. No. And it, it's not like Duke and North Carolina basketball where they can play four times a year. I don't – maybe I'm in the minority thinking that no. way, but that's how I think. Let me – let me well, quick before you go, though. You cover big-time college sports. Uh, I don't understand anybody from the Big Ten West voting – to go that route. I mean, you know what I mean? I don't understand how you could go to where Ohio State and Michigan could play back-to-back weeks first for the game and then for the championship. I don't know why anybody in the West, because that would just – I don't – I don't, you know what I mean? I don't understand how that could be the fervor that's being built right now. Uh, so I'm still waiting to see that actually become concrete. I don't – I'm not necessarily sure it's going to happen. But, you know yeah. – Yeah, you're right. And, when you and move we'll to 16 or 20 doing. members in a conference – you got to do something to juice it up, I guess. But I'm not sure that'd be juicing it up. But, uh, hey, Bill, you got anything else to say, Bill, before I land this plane? <laughs> no, man. It was good being on with you, as always. Hopefully, maybe we can catch up around Ohio State-Michigan week if our oh. predictions come true. Like I said, you always want to live in the moment because when you get caught looking ahead, then you can get yes. in trouble a little bit. But uh, it's okay to kind of start peeking at that and oh. thinking how cool it will be on Thanksgiving weekend if those two are 11-0. and Exactly. Like I've said, it's like two big, uh, two big oil tankers coming at each other in the Suez Canal. You know what I mean? And we all know there's very little wiggle room in the Suez Canal, as we found out <laughs> last year. But ladies and gentlemen, that's Bill Bitter of the Sporting News. I'm Tim May. Uh, this has been the Tim May Podcast. Until next week, we'll see you then.